welcome everybody. Uh, I see there's quite a few uh, familiar faces in the in the audience here, and uh, quite a few other folks that we haven't met yet. So, uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, my name is Craig Kaiser. I'm going to be your host today. I'm the president and co-founder of Landgate. Um, real quick plug uh, for those of you who uh, have not heard of us before. Uh, we are an exciting new uh, data analytics company and marketplace built primarily for landowners uh, in the United States. So I have a very strong uh, scientific background. Um, so does many members of our team. And what we've done is put together a very interesting platform where landowners can get a plethora of information, everything uh, in, in data analytics, all the way from uh, solar energy, wind energy, battery storage, um, all the way down to mining minerals, oil and gas minerals, carbon credits, um, really the, the kind of the hard to value type and the, the hard to understand different types of resources on property. So we've built a very cool platform at any point. You guys can go to landgate.com, look up your property, claim yourself as the owner and get a very large amount of information that you likely, it doesn't really matter how long you've owned the property, um, a lot of information that you've probably never been exposed to uh, by just simply going to the website. It's free, doesn't cost anything. Um, another really quick plug, we do have an application that's built for landowners, real estate agents, land professionals, uh, where we provide enormous amounts of land ownership information uh, with all of that energy and natural resource information appended to those parcels. So if you wanna figure out what your neighbors have on their property, if you wanna figure out who your neighbors are, uh, if you want to keep track of land that you own or manage, we have a really, really cool tool for that. Um, but without further uh, delay, uh, today we're going to be talking specifically about wind energy leasing. Uh, for those of you who have been in our webinars before, you know that this is a, a, a very uh, informal type of webinar that we do. I'm not going to kill you with PowerPoint slides. Um, I have about five or six slides that we'll go over. Um, those slides will be made available to everyone that's in attendance, we'll send those out. This is being recorded. So at any point, uh, if you wanna, you know, later this weekend, if you wanna uh, co go back over some of the things we talked about, the recording will be sent out to you as well. Um, we do participate, have, where we do uh, promote the participation of uh, all of you heavily in these webinars. Um, I'm gonna go over a few slides, but really uh, what what drives the the, the productivity of these webinars is you all asking questions. So shoot at will, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, quick uh, disclaimer, I am not an attorney. I don't wanna be an attorney and I don't claim to be an attorney. Um, I'm also not a financial advisor. We're gonna talk about um, some leasing clauses terms. We're gonna talk about some financial implications to solar leasing, uh, but a disclaimer that if you do need uh, you know, licensed representation uh, for either uh, legal representation or financial representation. Uh, reach out to those folks. Uh, if you don't know anybody that specifically focus on energy, reach out to us. We're happy to recommend somebody in your in your area that that can assist you. Um, any of your questions, I'd ask you to please email those to Michaela. Uh, Michaela is one of our team members. Her email is mb at landgate.com. You can see that in the bottom left corner of the screen there. Any questions you have uh, revolving around energy leasing, please shoot those over to her. Uh, when I get through with the presentation in 15, 20 minutes, we're gonna start uh, rattling through those questions. If we do not get your questions answered in this webinar, we will follow up with you with an email um, to get all those, those questions answered. Um, again, like I said, this is a pretty, large, at least a, a very interesting topic across the United States. We have a very large number of participants. Uh, one thing, if you wouldn't mind, you don't have to disclose your name or anything, but if you could, just so we can understand where people are at or in the country on this webinar right now, um, in the chat, just go ahead and put what county and state you're from. Um, and let's go ahead and if you could, in the next couple minutes, go ahead and knock that out. Uh, I'll let you know where I'm standing right now. I live in El Paso County, Colorado. Uh, right outside of Colorado Springs, just south of Denver. This topic is very, very crucial for the area where I live. You're gonna see some screen captures from the Landgate application. Uh, 
where it's literally a wind farm from where I'm standing outside of Colorado Springs to the county line of Kansas is full of wind turbines. Uh, there's some really critical aspects of wind leasing that I think every landowner who's interested needs to know about. And once you have a wind lease on your property, you have wind turbines on your property, there's some other implications that are very, very beneficial to landowners as well. And we're gonna cover that. So we'll go ahead and jump into it here. Um, just an overview of what, what we're talking about with wind energy leasing. If you've ever driven out in the country and most of these large wind farms are in rural areas. You're not going to see them um, in the urban areas of Houston or Chicago or New York or any there and anywhere there. Mostly through the Midwest, uh, expanding quickly into the Rockies regions. Texas, very very large, especially in the southeast part of Texas. Uh, but this screen capture you're looking at here, uh, again, like I said, I'm standing a little bit off the map, about right here. But um, this map shows you all of these little triangles. These are all individual wind turbines, and this is uh, roughly the, the Colorado state line. So you're looking at a span of probably 150 miles. And if you're driving along I-70 and you've been driving, driving on interstates, you're going to see these enormous uh, wind towers. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about large commercial scale wind energy. Um, there's over 1,000 different individual wind farms in the United States with over 70,000 active turbines, and that's increasing uh, quite rapidly. Um, depending on the vintage of the turbines of the farm that you're looking at, the earlier farms that went up, much smaller wind turbines and generated anywhere from one to one and a half megawatts, even sometimes lower than that. The newer turbines, obviously much larger, can generate more electricity, you're seeing on average anywhere from two to three megawatts. And as far as the spacing goes, uh, about one of these large turbines takes up from a spatial area about 80 acres. Now that doesn't mean that's the actual footprint of the tower, which is only maybe an acre or two. But as far as how tightly they space these individual turbines, you're looking relatively 80 acres for each turbine. Um, for those of you who have been in some of our other webinars with solar energy, carbon credits, things like that, one thing that's unique with wind energy, especially with these very large um, commercial farms, the larger the tracts of land, the more ideal it is from a wind perspective. You're also seeing on this map here, these red lines, these yellow dots, these red lines are those really, really large uh, transmission lines that you see driving down the road. Um, enormous, enormous transmission lines that carry a lot of power. Now, you obviously want to be in an area where you can, as far as your land goes, where power can be generated, put onto the grid, and then sold to a consumer. That's what these transmission lines do. These substations, these little yellow dots, are those um, very big transformer-looking things that you drive by that these transmission lines connect to. Consider those substations as enormous wall outlets. That's where you can plug in and put electrons into the grid, the electricity grid, or you can pull electrons out. Okay, so same thing as you have a wall outlet in, right down here on my wall, and I can plug appliances in and out of that thing, pull electrons mostly off out of, out of the wall. But I can also put electrons in if I wanted to. Um, same thing with these substations. It's in, just an enormous wall outlet to get electrons on and off the grid. So that's what a lot of developers look for. Where do you have transmission lines? Where do you have substations? And for wind farms, as you can see, some of these wind farms, they're enormous. I mean, if this is 150 miles across, you're looking at, you know, one of these wind farms probably consumes two, three, four, 500,000 acres. So from a developer's perspective, the less number of landowners that they have to deal with, the easier it is for them, the less cost there is involved because there is a lot of regulatory work. There's a lot of uh, land title work that goes into putting up wind farms. So for those of you listening, wondering, is my property going to be good? Can I put a, you know, am I gonna be involved with a wind farm? The larger property that you have and the closer you are 
to a transmission line and substation, it increases your chances. The smaller your property is and the further you are away from a transmission line or substation, the more it decreases your chances. Now, if you're asking, well, how do I find that out? Very easily go to landgate.com, look up your parcel, claim ownership, and we will tell you the closest transmission line to the par your parcel. We'll tell you the closest substation. We'll actually tell you the closest solar farm, the closest wind farm, and a bunch of other things. But you can find that out for free, uh, leveraging our platform. What is required for wind energy leasing? It is surface ownership. We talked last week or two weeks ago about solar leasing and a bunch of other different types of, of leasing where sometimes you're going to need to have the mineral estate too, not just the surface estate, you're gonna to need to own the mineral estate too. That's not nearly as critical with wind leasing. Since a lot of these tracks are ranches, farms, a lot of the times the mineral rights are associated with them. For wind energy, it's not necessarily required. You're looking at another screen capture here. Now we're, we're zoomed into a much closer level, but you're seeing an actual wind farm. These blades are spinning right now, most likely. Uh, this is in Eastern Colorado as well, but you're seeing uh, each one of these triangles is an individual turbine. You can see the lease roads here where they have buried cables and they have access for maintenance, things like that. Um, but this section here is probably half an acre and there's four wind turbines on that individual's uh, section. That's another really cool thing about Landgate is, you know, I'm from a very rural area. I grew up in a farming ranching community. My, families are, my family are a bunch of ranchers. Um, they never really knew who owned land around their, their property. That's a really cool feature that Landgate offers. $25 a month, and you get who owns every single parcel across the United States. 174 million parcels. We don't do it just by state. We do it across the country, but you get a lot of this other uh, interesting data along with it. Um, but back to the leasing here. So it's wind energy leasing is driven almost primarily 100% by who owns the surface rights. Uh, again, we talk about how closer you do electrical infrastructure, transmission line substations. Um, another thing that's really important and is usually not available to landowners is what's called a renewable energy incentive um, or an REC. So what that, what that is, is in certain areas, and it's not just based on a, even an individual county or an individual state, but there are areas that have been designated by a utility or municipality, maybe county level, state level, federal level, where there are financial incentives for energy development companies to build solar and wind projects in certain areas versus another area. So if a utility company needs a major transmission line built, but the utility doesn't have the money, they'll offer an incentive for an energy company to go in and build a very large wind farm. The energy company might put in their own transmission line. So it benefits the utility and also benefits the, the developer. Uh, again, the larger tracks, the better, because that really makes the land work and the administrative work on the regulatory side much easier for the developer. As you can see here, you can see that um, James Thomas Mitchell owns this piece of property, this property, Philip Hart owns this property, this property. If you look at all of where all of these wind turbines are, you're probably looking at, you know, maybe 10 or 15 individual landowners in covering 20,000 acres. Now, if you'd go further east in the United States, and let's say you go outside of Baltimore or Boston, and you look at how many landowners are gonna have 20,000 acres of land, you're probably gonna have 50,000, 100,000 landowners on that 20,000 acres, which is why you're gonna see the addition, if there's any additional new uh, wind farms that are going to be built, it's going to be primarily in areas where you have very large parcels and large farms and ranches. Um, so that's what you're seeing now. <laughs> Before we get any further, a lot of questions I get is, what are you, Craig, what are you seeing as far as additional wind energy in the United States? I think you're going to see a very large push for a significant amount of wind energy going offshore um, versus enormous amounts of the capital that's being allocated to wind energy going to onshore wind energy. 
you're still seeing new projects being built. We just, I just talked to a, a user of the platform a few days ago, just starting to pour concrete in their foundations. These enormous wind turbines sit on enormous blocks of concrete um, to, to keep them stable so they don't fall over. Uh, but there is uh, active projects being built, being planned, uh, being permitted, being leased up uh, across the United States right now. Uh, here's a pretty critical component. And again, there's quite a bit on this slide, but utilize this slide as a resource. If wind energy leasing is really something that you're considering as a landowner, this is a very crucial slide. It's understanding what a wind lease actually is and the different phases to that lease. So what we call the development phase, and look at the bottom here, you're looking at timing, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six. And then you see this huge chunk of year anywhere from seven to 30, sometimes 50 years. And we don't have a whole lot of stuff above that. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why that it, that it is the way that it is um, in this slide. But to get started, the development phase of a solar lease is not technically a lease in itself. It's kind of an option. So the lease um, or amounts are much lower, usually on a per acre basis. So if we go back to the previous slide, likely all of these landowners in this area were in, and it doesn't even matter if they have a wind turbine on them or not. Most likely all of those landowners were in this development phase of a wind lease. What's happening during that time is a development company has identified a certain area where they have transmission lines, substations, they have enough wind, all of the factors that would make it from a high level a good location. They're gonna go ahead and secure the land in that area. And that's the first phase, that's the development phase. And that's usually year one. So that's planning, lease acquisitions. Uh, what happens for the next two to four or five years is that development company has to get a lot of regulatory things in order. They have to apply to what's called a interconnection queue. Being able to, all those electrons that they're gonna generate, being able to have the right to plug that new generator, that's your enormous wind farm, to plug that thing into the grid and start supplying electrons. So they have to do that. They have to go through um, other type of biological permitting. So wildlife permits, going through Divi division, wild, D division of natural resources, division of wildlife, doing everything they need to do on the regulatory side there. They have to find somebody to buy the power. So this process takes quite a bit of time. Now, during that time, you are being paid on a per acre basis. You're not being paid on a per turbine basis because they don't really know where the turbines are going to be located yet. All right, they're still going through engineering processes and all of that, but you'll get paid on a per acre basis for every year that they continue that, that process. Now, once they get to all of their permits have been approved, they're ready to go, they actually have supply chain, meaning that they have the towers, they have the wind turbines, they're gonna enter construction phase. Now that elevates the lease to a whole different phase. If the land, if your land has been chosen or would be chosen to have a wind turbine on it, like I said, if we go back here, not everybody gets a wind turbine on them. There's a couple factors to that. Maybe they don't have ideal access on the property. Maybe there's a big hill or there's something, or maybe the landowner has negotiated so hard. Maybe this landowner right here, we're seeing this and I won't, won't say their name, but you can see their name. Maybe they negotiated way higher than James Thomas Mitchell over here. And the developing company said, well, wait a minute, this individual asked for, and throwing a, a rough number here, $3,000 per turbine or $5,000 per turbine every year. And Mr. Mitchell over here says, you know what? I'll be happy with 3,000. This guy uh, this guy negotiated 5,000 a turbine. Mr. Mitchell said, I'll take 3,000 a turbine, put as many on my properties as you can get. Well, that's who's gonna get the turbines. So that's an important, important uh, thing to do. Make sure you're getting a good deal. Put it in a competitive marketplace like Landgate. Get it, in a, get it out there as a listing, get as many offers as you can. But do not negotiate yourself out of a deal 
or you'll be end up looking at the wind turbines and not being paid by them because that's how the tur leases get paid how many turbines get put on your property so once they figure out where these turbines are going to go excavators will show up they'll dig a really big pit because that's where they have to put the that concrete foundation but your lease goes into a different phase and the payments go up significantly so rather than earning maybe 10 to 15 dollars per acre uh, maybe it's, i've seen it down to like two or three dollars per acre in the development phase now, once they've gone to the construction phase, typically the lease is going to be structured that you're going to be compensated on how many turbines are going to be on your property, what's the length of the buried cable going to be on your property, and then you're going to find out whether you're actually going to be getting paid significantly, because that's when the significant payments start. Once everything is stood up, the cranes come in, put the hubs on the towers, put the blades on, and they start spinning. That's the operational phase. Now that phase can go anywhere from 30 years to 50 years. After that, depending on what types of uh, turbines have been put in, what the atmospheric conditions are, how well they hold up to uh, different weather events, things like that. But it's a very, very long time, and it's a very, very long lease payment schedule, and we'll talk about that later. You do have options. You don't just have to sit there and collect the paycheck every 50 years. You do have options of being able to cash that lease out and 1031 exchange it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's a very, very um, interesting option for landowners once you get to the operational phase. So again, the terms, and these are, some, these are you know, high level points that you need to consider um, for wind leasing here. You know, that option period, depending on who the developers are, what type of wind farm it is, they, it can vary, but typically up to four to five years. The overall lease term, once it starts producing and you start getting paid significant amounts, significant amounts of, of dollars there, usually 25 to 30 years with what they call options to extend. So they'll go, they'll go in and say, okay, um, Michaela Bishop, who's you know my my colleague on the on the call here, who's keeping track of all of your questions that you're submitting and we're going to get to those here in a little bit. Um, but Michaela Bishop is going to go ahead and get a lease offer and I'm going to say 30 years with two options, two 10 year options. Well, what does that mean? That means the first 30 years, absolutely, they're planning on having that wind turbine rotate and generate power and pay you for 30 years. Now they're planning on that to pay you for 30 years. They have the option if things are going well with the project and it's still profitable, all of these things, they can extend it for 10 more years or even another option to extend it 10 more years. So it can actually go to 50 years, which would be a good thing because that's more cash flow for you and your property. Um, again, when I said the option area is paid on a per acre basis, that's going to be based on your actual property outline. How many acres do you own? Because again, they have not move they, they don't really know where the turbines are going to go they don't know how many turbines you're going to get on your property they don't even know how many they're probably going to ultimately put in the wind farm at that point once they're leasing to you so they'll lease all of your acres they call that a gross acreage amount um again it's a smaller amount anywhere from two to three to 15 or 20 depending on where you're at um, dollars per acre per year and that just keeps going the further they get the project down the road the more of those option payments you get. But, you know, that's really when you start making money is when you start moving from that option per acre payment to a more turbine-based payment. Um, going down to that second section there, well, what, is the, what does the uh, per turbine basis kind of look like? Um, it depends on the size of the turbine. How many megawatts per turbine is typically going to determine how many dollars they're going to pay for that turbine? Anywhere from five to eight thousand dollars per megawatt is pretty typical. But again, things are changing quickly. Sometimes it goes higher. Sometimes it goes lower. Um, one of the most critical aspects to understand when you're talking about your lease payment with 
your your developer or even multiple developers is what the minimum amount you're going to be paid regardless of what happens let's say the wind doesn't blow for a year which if you're on this call from wyoming you would probably be very happy about that because it's an extraordinarily windy place um but let's say it doesn't blow the wind doesn't blow at all the minimum payment is what you would receive for that year regardless of what the wind turbine does that's a really critical component. A lot of landowners get hung up on what's called the royalty component. And we'll talk about this here in bullet point two. Wind payments are not real royalties. You are not paid based on what the price of electricity is and how much electricity was generated. That would be when you're a true royalty is based on commodity prices. That's what you'll see with minerals, mining, oil and gas. Um, you'll see that with other industries. A true royalty is what how much revenue is generated based on the commodity price. The royalty payment for wind energy is a set price based on how much energy is produced. So it's not based if the if price of energy goes up in 20 years, it doesn't really matter if it's a true royalty, well, you'd be making a lot more money. That's not really the way of royalty wind payment structured. Um, but the downfall, the, at least the, the, the hole that I see a lot of landowners stepping in is really focusing their time, energy, and effort negotiating on the royalty component, arguing for a little bit higher payment if the wind turbine generates X amount of megawatts per month or per, per quarter, whereas the majority of leases that we've seen go through the platform, and again, we're not a broker, we're not on either side of the equation, we've just created a marketplace where buyers and sellers can interact. But when we've seen deals go through the platform, the majority of wind um, lease folks out there who are selling that wind lease, which we'll talk about on this slide, the majority of them have only seen that royalty payment kick in a small handful of times. There's quite a few folks that have never seen it. So what really drives your bottom line is that minimum payment. No matter what happens, what are you gonna get paid? And I would highly suggest, you know, for the folks that may be negotiating currently or plan to be negotiating or um, are in either of those phases, make sure you're focusing a lot of time and effort on that minimum payment because that's once you get to the point where you may want to consider selling your lease, you do not have to sell your property. That's the first bullet point. Huge thing that most landowners don't realize, you can actually sell once the turbine actually even starts being constructed you can sell the future cash flow payments off of that wind turbine. You do not have to sell your land. So you can essentially sell your lease, get your cash payments discounted, but sell your discounted uh, cash payments up front, reinvest those into other investment opportunities. Most people don't realize that that's an option for them, but it's becoming very, very popular in the United States. And I'll tell you uh, a couple of reasons why that is. Um, but again, when you get to that phase and you're wanting to sell that cash flow, financial investors who buy the cash flow will look at it and they're going to calculate what is the minimum payments. What are you guaranteed to be paid over 50 years? And that's what they're going to run their discounted cash flow models on. And that's how they're going to come up with their offers. The royalty payments that might kick in once or maybe twice a year they really don't factor those in from what we've seen. So really focus on those minimum payments. Um, but this is something I do wanna spend a little bit of time on here because most landowners do not realize this is something they can do. And it's an enormous thing that it, it's a huge financial windfall for the folks that take advantage of this. Most folks who get a wind turbine on their property look at that thing like it's an oil and gas well. It's just sitting there churning, paying them a true royalty and it's not. It's not an oil and gas well, it's not, a, it's not a mining location. Your payments will not increase as the commodity that it's producing increases. Wind payments are essentially rent payments. You've rented out your property or you will be renting out your property for a very significant amount of time. Those payments and that lease agreement has monetary value because there's a commitment from the developer to you 
that they're going to pay you this amount of money. <clears throat> people are willing to buy, <clears throat> excuse me, people are willing to buy that cash flow payment. Okay. So you can see those first couple bullet points there. Um, and then we already talked a little bit about the rental payments. They are not true royalty payments. I've had some conversations with some very, very large landowners. There's a landowner who had, um, their family had over 100 turbines. Just them had over 100 turbines on their property. Enormous ranching family. Won't tell you where they're from, um, but sizable, sizable a property holder. You can imagine having 100,000 or 100 wind turbines on your property. That's hundreds of thousands of acres. Um, they didn't understand because they had a significant mineral holding as well. And they could see their mineral values go up and down based on the price of oil. And as the price of oil increased, their royalty checks shot through the roof. As the oil price came down, well, the royalty checks came down. They assumed their wind turbine payments were the same thing. So they said to me, they said, Craig, well, why would we ever sell this stuff? This is, I mean, this is mailbox money. I said, it is not. It's a rent payment. I said, you've rented the property. I said, if the price of energy goes up in time, you're not going to get paid anymore. So if the price of energy doubles over the course of 20 years, you're not going to get paid anymore. That's different than if the price of oil goes from $40 a barrel to $150 a barrel. Oil and gas royalty, that is a true royalty. Wind rent payments are not. Okay? They're based on the number of wind turbines on the property, and they're not based on the commodity price. So what that means, and this is a very critical component, I, and again, I want to stress this. If you get wind turbines on your property, you've hit a home run. You've won the lottery. You've done a phenomenal job. You negotiated correctly. You're getting cash flow. You've generated enormous amount of revenue that was no longer there or that was, that was not there in the first place. So you've done a very good job. But you need to understand what that is relative to what it's not. Again, most people, again, that family says, why would we ever sell this? This is just like oil wells. No, it's not. It's not a royalty payment. But I also told them, I said, it's losing money over time. And they said to me, hold on a minute. No, there's no way. It's increasing over time. I said, well, what is your escalator? An escalator is a part of the lease where if you're getting paid, let's say you have one wind turbine in your property, you get paid $10,000 for that year for that one wind turbine. The next year, you're going to get paid 1% more than that. The next year, you'll get paid 1% more, 1% more, 1% more, more. So it increases through time. That's called an escalator. Those are typically 1% to 2%. I've seen a few that are based off of a percentage of CPI or the inflation rate, which is still significantly below the inflation rate. So they look at it and they say, okay, my payments are increasing through time. I said, okay, they are. But I said, inflation, and this is a, I won't get into politics on either side, but it's widely accepted that at a minimum, inflation is a five to 8%. Certain goods and services, again, widely accepted. Let's go and fill your pickup up or your car up with gas. Over 30% inflation for certain goods and services over the last two or three years. The payments are only going up one or 2%. And inflation is five to 8% and other things much, much higher. The cash flow itself is losing money. So you, again, you've won the lottery. You've done a phenomenal job. But the payments are losing money over time. 100 wind turbines on a ranch. And they were looking at it the wrong way. They thought they were royalties and they were going to keep getting paid even more as the price of energy went up. That's not the case. They were realizing that, no, this is a rent payment. And we're actually losing money. And this is a very financially savvy family, unbelievably financially savvy, but they were looking at it the wrong way. This is a rent payment. And they realized we need to sell this immediately. <laughs> Unfortunately for them, the next month after I had talked with them, 60 of their wind turbines were canceled, meaning that they were spinning, they were generating revenue, but these payments are not guaranteed. Just because it says 30 years in the lease does not mean that the payments are going to go for 30 years. And it certainly doesn't mean that it's going to go for an option 10 and another option 10. Okay. And this is say, and this is not, 
the wind energy being bad, bad guys. They're not. For the, the vast majority of folks in the wind industry, solar industry, oil and gas, all of these industries, the vast majority of folks are very good, upstanding, not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. But there's bad actors in every one of them. We're not, we're not talking about them. This is common practice for the wind industry, solar industry, oil and gas industry. Any resource development company has the right to terminate the lease at any time they see fit. Sometimes the project can become a, uneconomic. A catastrophic storm can come in, knock out a bunch of solar panels, knock down a bunch of wind turbines. And if the incentives to not reinstall those or to rebuild those, or they're just not economic in the first place after a certain period of time, they do not have to rebuild that project and the lease essentially ends, as does your cash flow. So that was another third critical factor for this family is they had banked in their head hundreds of thousands of dollars coming in every year. I mean, millions for this family, millions of dollars every year. It stopped in an instant. So there is a risk to that. There's a risk to how long do you think the project is going to be financially viable? Because at any moment, they can turn them off, they can take them down, and, and you can basically be done with that lease. Now, a question I'm sure will come up is what happens if what, what happens at the end of the lease? You've got this 300 foot tower there, um, all of this buried cable. What what do you what liabilities do you as the landowner have? You don't have any liabilities. The vast majority of wind energy companies, upstanding folks, they have, and in every lease that you should even look at, it should have a reclamation clause in there. It is the developers, not the landowners. It's the developer's job, and they are bonded, and they have to put up a bond for this to be able to get permits in every state in the United States. But it's their responsibility to clean up and reclaim anything that they had disturbed. So the land looks exactly the way it did, if not better, than when they showed up. Okay, so they do have to do that. I just want to get that question out of the way. Um, but shifting back to um, these payments are not guaranteed and why a significant amount of landowners are choosing to sell their lease. Again, not selling their land, but selling their lease is there's something called a 1031 exchange that these leases qualify for. So, I mean, throw a couple of real numbers out there. So if a family in Illinois sells three wind turbines and they get paid $2 million, if they don't 1031 exchange that, they're going to have to pay tax on that $3 million revenue that comes into their home. Utilizing a 1031 exchange means that they kept their property. This was a family that owned a bunch of farmland in Illinois. They kept their property. They kept the farmland which you can still farm if there's a wind tower on your property. Only take Again, the tower takes up one to maybe two acres, if that. But they were still farming, so they had their farm ground. They sold the lease, kept the farm ground. But when they sold that lease and were paid $2 million, they did a 1031 exchange, and they did tax-free, bought an adjacent piece of farm ground, which is making far more than 1% or 2%. So they hold this money forward, increasing in value at one or 2% every year. They brought that money forward, invested it in adjacent farm ground that they're making close to 10% year over year. So they turned that, let's say maybe they got $2 million today when they would have been paid $4 million over 30 years, maybe been paid $4 million over 30 years. They were paid two today reinvested it in something that will probably be worth $10 million in 30 years. Again, these are not ideas that most landowners have been exposed to because this is fairly new. This is relative to mineral sales, things like that. Selling and leasing for wind is, is still fairly new. There's not 120 years of precedent here. So that is part of what Landgate does. Landgate is a marketplace for those of you who are interested in trying to get lease offers for your property. There is, it's completely free to list. There's no commission. There's no obligation to accept offers. You go ahead and click on your property, create an outline, 
and you're raising your hand in front of some of the world's largest energy developers and saying, I'm interested in receiving offers for leasing my land. No obligation, no cost. Even if you accept something, there's no cost. But for those of you who may be listening who already have wind turbines on their property, this is an opportunity that most of you probably are not aware of. Um, I would highly recommend at least considering the option here just because it's worked out phenomenally well for some of the folks, some of the landowners who utilize our platform, basically raising the hand saying, hey, I've got one or two wind turbines. Who wants to buy them? Send me your best offers. And uh, it's worked out quite well for, for multiple different families in that situation. So um, we'll go ahead and shoot over and answer some questions here. Um, again, if you guys have any more, if you have any questions, send them in to mb at landgate.com. Uh, we'll start out here for Barry. Uh, what's the minimum acreage, acreage needed for a wind lease? <clears throat> for a commercial side, for the wind farms we've been talking about, it's really, really difficult for anybody with less than 20 acres to get a turbine on their property. It's not impossible. It's not impossible at all. It's really what relative, what's the average acreage size of parcels around wherever you're at. If you have a 20 acre parcel, but you're surrounded by parcels that look like this, you're probably not gonna get a wind turbine on it, right? Here's a 20 acre parcel. See where my mouse is? This is probably a 20 acre parcel. It doesn't make sense for the developer to go through a lot of regulatory hoops to put one turbine here when they can go over here and put eight on James Mitchell, or they can put multiple here on uh, Mr. Luking. So it really depends on what type of parcels are around you. Now, if you're in, let's say, Eastern Pennsylvania, well, there's no four, five, 600 acre tracks there. So they may have to piece together a bunch of 20 acre tracks and you may have an opportunity there. But I'd say at a minimum, probably gonna be around 20 acres. Obviously from there up, the larger parcels you have, along with proximity to transmission line substations, the better off you're gonna be. All right, we'll go ahead and go to Bobby. Is there anything I can do to my land to increase my chances of getting a wind lease offer? Bobby, great question, absolutely. Um, Create a listing. You have to get it into a in, you have to get it into a competitive environment. If you don't have an absolutely perfect wind parcel, you're probably never going to get anybody reaching out to you and saying, "Hey, are you interested in leasing? Are you interested in leasing your property?" We see every day on the platform folks across the United States who've just listed their property. Again, no commission, no fees, but they get re they get folks reaching out to them saying, hey, I'm kind of interested. What do you have? And you start a dialogue directly between the developer and yourself. So that'd be the number one thing I could say. If you're interested, and it's not just wind leasing, if you're interested in, in solar. So if you, don't, if you have a smaller piece of, of property, you have a smaller parcel, wind may not be ideal for you, but solar could work really well. Battery storage could work really, really well. So if you own, again, we'll jump back to this map really quick. Let's say um, the individual asked that question, they own this piece of property here. And let's say maybe that's only 10, 15 acres. Probably not great for wind because at max you can put one turbine on it. But they're sitting right next to a substation with 15 acres. This 15 acres could be worth a couple million dollars for battery storage. Just simply pulling the electrons off of the grid and literally putting them into enormous batteries. So that's the cool thing about Landgate. We are talking about wind energy today, but there's all of these different types of natural resources, even ag and recreation. There's all of these different types of resources that you can utilize to generate money from your property. And that's, that's why you know, when you click on your parcel, we're gonna show you what the relatively high and low values are for that stuff. Um, We'll go to the next one. Can it go in forested areas or only cleared land? And that's a question from Brianne. Um, it can go in both. 
as you can see here, this is Eastern Colorado. This is Plains country. This is the Great Plains. Not a lot of trees unless you're down in a river valley. Um, clearly, there's no problem putting up um, turbines here. What you'll see on the eastern portion of the United States, where there's where they actually get rain and you actually have trees and things like that, um, they'll do ridge top uh, wind farms. So instead of them being spaced out like you see here, which are kind of like a what you'd say like a shotgun blast, you'll see a line of wind turbines up on top of a ridge. Now, in the immediately adjacent areas, depending on the size of the trees, they'll have to cut the trees right around the immediate perimeter of the turbine, but it doesn't exclude forested areas from uh, being capable of developing wind energy. And you can see that through Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, there's quite a few wind farms in that area. The next question is uh, uh, a gentleman that I've talked to before. It's great to see, great to see you during the webinar, Phil. Thanks for, for giving us some time. Uh, the question is, they don't want to put a turbine on our land, but want to cross our lands with power lines and towers. Can you address that? It's a good question because it's probably two different groups, potentially. I, I don't want to, it potentially could be. It's either, is the utility company, so, for where, where I have a feeling where this is going to be, um, if either and people in the Colorado region will understand these companies, uh, if either Tri-State or Excel is putting in a line, well, that's a utility company. They're not the ones that are putting up the wind turbines. Then you'd be negotiating with those utility companies. If it is some of these very large wind companies, as for instance, let's say Vestas or Nextera, um, some of those type of companies, then you would be negotiating with the developer on a transmission line type basis. So if it was me, and happy to, uh, you know, Phil, if you want to call tomorrow, we can talk about it even more. If it was me, I'd try to leverage, because obviously they have to cross your land, I would try to leverage to see if you could do anything you can to get some turbines on you as well, in conjunction with giving them a decent deal for an easement or a right of way for their transmission line. So again, the more acreage you have, the more bargaining chips you have in your hand, right? It's really, what do you want? What is What are the people you're negotiating against want? And what do you want, right? And then the more chips you have, obviously the better it's going to be for you there. But um, there's a lot, I mean, in Eastern Colorado, this is not just in Eastern Colorado. You're gonna see, especially if you're a large landowner, you're gonna start seeing a lot of uh, transmission lines coming in because our grid cannot sustain with the amount of electrification that their goals have been set. Again, I'm not gonna, not gonna wander into whether they're good ideas or bad ideas or realistic or unrealistic. But for us to electrify, enormous vehicle fleets, a lot of our industry, we do not have enough infrastructure to move the electrons the way that we need. So as these projects become more prolific, as you have more uh, solar farms, as you have more wind farms and more battery storage, you're going to see in conjunction with these projects, you're going to see more transmission lines coming as well. Um, so especially you landowners, large, very large landowners who are on the call, um, be aware of that, that Everything's a negotiation. Again, and with your lease, everything's a negotiation. Everything, regardless of what you're being told, everything is negotiable. What do you want out of the deal? What's most ideal for you and your family? And how does it work with the developer, right? Everything can be negotiable. Again, do not negotiate yourself out of a deal. You don't want to be the person who is stuck looking at the wind turbines but you're not being paid for them, right? Um, next one, how can you tell if you have a good wind area? So Mary, uh, good question. Thanks for sending that in. Um, go to landgate.com, find your parcel on the map, claim yourself as the owner, and Landgate's gonna provide for you a lot of different metrics there, and we're gonna tell you how relatively good your solar, wind, battery storage, your oil and gas minerals, we're gonna tell you relatively how good they are. Okay, so um, 
along with that, and this is, you know, this to me talking about this is about three weeks premature, but for everyone that's in the call that's a landowner and wants more information about their property, come back to Landgate here in about two or three weeks, you'll probably all get an email notification you're gonna be able to go to landgate.com for free and print out a very detailed natural resource report for your property at no cost. So you can download that, get all of that information, and it's gonna be a very, very robust breakdown of you, excuse, excuse me, your specific parcel. So uh, that'll be coming here in about, uh, about three or four weeks. Uh, so yeah, again, we'll send you a notification about that. Uh, next question is, Richard, have you ever seen wind and solar payments put up together, uh, panels put up together? Can they exist in your proximity? Do they connect to the same session transmission line? Very good question, Richard. Yes, there are some areas where uh, solar and wind are being are taking place on the same parcel. Now, you don't see it very often. Um, there's, a, there's a couple reasons why, and it's about a two-hour explanation. So... I won't get into it. Some of it has to do with the incentives and who gets paid what for what piece of, for, for what electrons going through a certain substation. Um, but to answer your questions, yes, they, I've seen them um, going through the same substation on the same parcel. Uh, you don't see it as much anymore. Some of the really early solar farms and wind projects in Southern California, and it's kind of cool if you, um, if you subscribe to our system, if you are a Landgate user, again, $25 a month, and you turn on that data in Southern California, and you see all of the solar farms, you see all of the wind farms, um, it is kind of cool to see how they utilize, maximum, you know, maximize the space there. Um, a lot of solar developers, as long as it's not, as long as it's not interrupting the irradiance factor, so as long as there's not a big shadow, from the wind turbine crossing their solar panels every day. Um, it makes a lot of sense, but a lot of the solar developers and wind developers, two different groups. So there needs to be some cross coordination going on there as well. So um, good question though. What are the pitfalls to avoid when negotiating a lease from, from Alan? Um, great question. I'd say the biggest pitfall again, is do not negotiate yourself out of a lease. I can tell you not, I mean, I've, I'm not a huge landowner like, like some of these individuals. Um, again, I'm co-founder and president of a technology company, but I know a lot of these folks on a personal level. And it didn't work out very well for some folks who were bragging about how much more they got per acre in their lease or per turbine in their lease because they didn't end up getting any wind turbines or they didn't end up, end up getting any solar panels, okay? So if you're in an area, and this is something that you're, you're, some of you are probably familiar with, if you're in a really good area for wind, it's flat and there's no trees and you're by a substation transmission line, you're probably in a really good area for solar as well. So again, no matter which one you're leasing, you're negotiating for, do not negotiate yourself out of a lease. This is not, this type of negotiating is not like negotiating an oil and gas lease. It's not like negotiating a mining lease. It's not like negotiating a carbon credit lease. These types of leases can be won or lost from a landowner's perspective based on how well they conduct themselves and trying to accomplish your goal. Your goal is to generate revenue on your property. The way to maximize that is get as many offers as possible. Know that there's a competitive marketplace that exists. Leverage that competitive marketplace. Compare and contrast your different offers. And then make the best decision you can for your family. That's the best um, suggestions I can make. And again, at when you get to the point where you need to consult an energy-specific attorney, again, we know a lot of these folks across the United States, and you need recommendation of who to call, let us know. We're happy to recommend folks across, you know, from wherever you're at. Um, but if you're a large landowner, if, you know, Mr. Mitchell here or whoever this, Luke Higg or Philip Hart, whoever these guys are, you can really do a lot of negotiating yourselves as far as what you want to get paid. But once you're ready to sign that lease, it's always wise to get an attorney, have them look over that lease, um, 
There's some really, really good ones out there. There's also some attorneys that will bill you for 20 hours to look over a fairly boilerplate wind lease. So don't use that one. Use the individual who knows that, you know, they, they want to get you through the process, want to protect you as best they can. And we highly recommend that you guys uh, leverage those professionals as well. Uh, looks like Dan's got a question there. Uh, can you still run cattle on your land? Absolutely, you can. That's one of the really nice things about wind that differentiates it from solar. You can still heavily utilize your land. Again, these, you know, the footprint of the turbine, probably around one acre max. Now you're going to have some lease roads. Again, this is a really good example here. This is these these triangles are an actual turbine. So it's not taking up much of a footprint. You have a little bit of a lease road there, but there's cattle probably standing and grazing underneath these wind turbines as we speak. If this was farm ground, same thing. You can go ahead and, you know, you'll be plowing underneath these things. The wind, the, the blades are huge, but they're still, you know, 100 feet off of the ground. So you can still heavily utilize your land with wind, whereas solar, if you put 320 acres, this is probably a three... Now it's probably a 160. This is about 160 acres here. Um, but if you have this 160 and you put solar panels across that, you're really not use, using it for anything else other than solar panels. Payment is much, much higher, but um, you're not really able to utilize it that way. Um, Diana Reeves, can you put solar underneath this wind in the same acreage? Yes, you can. Um, it's not common, but if you're in a really, really good spot, um, again, if you find out you're in a really, really good spot using Landgate and you get multiple offers, we've seen that happen. So yeah, that is a possibility. Uh, you said solar energy needs the land to have mineral rights too, correct? That's a question from Amy. Um, in most cases, yes. The, the um, energy developers will preferentially choose a parcel where the surface owner and the mineral owner are the same individual. The reason for that, and you can go back and see um, at any point, go to Landgate and look at some of our previous webinars. We get into in we really go in depth the difference between surface ownership and mineral ownership. Um, the reason why is because the mineral estate is the dominant estate. So if somebody wants to come and capture their minerals in a certain way, maybe drilling them for oil and gas, the surface or the the uh, the mineral estate has dominance, and the surface estate estate has to yield. So um, that's not as big of an issue anymore. It was probably 10 or 15 years ago, a really large issue. But now with the advent of horizontal oil and gas drilling, you don't actually have to put the surface location of the well where uh, the minerals you're gonna extract from. So they can be multiple miles away. So there's actually been a lot of um, collaboration between oil and gas developers and solar developers where um, even folks that do not have uh, mineral rights have been able to get uh, solar panels on them. It just elevates your property. If you do have even a percentage of the ownership of the minerals, it does help with your chances of, of getting solar panels on you. Um, Hardeep's got a question. Can you have a crop like trees or orchard and lease for wind? From what I've seen, yes. Uh, you know, orchards aren't usually don't have too high of uh, tree canopy heights. So from what I've seen, it's been uh, something that, in, especially in California, where most of the, the orchards are, are at in the United States, um, that's where we've seen them. So I wouldn't think that would be a case where it would uh, reduce your chances all, all that much. Again, it's probably going to be more based off of what types of parcels are you surrounded by. If you're surrounded by enormous orchards and there's 100,000 acres there that between 40 or 50 landowners, they can go ahead and lease up. That would really, really help versus if everybody's got a you know five or 10 acre orchard, it would make it a little bit more difficult. Uh, we're getting to the end. We got two more questions left and then we're gonna wrap it up. I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, if the piece of land score is the same as solar and wind in today's market, which industry is more lucrative, which is trending up over the other one? David, great question. Um, Wind really, really was taking off strong five, six years ago. You're seeing it kind of draw back a little bit onshore, it's pushing hard offshore. Solar, if you have the opportunity for solar on your property, 
I would probably push to try to get solar. As far as the concentration of revenue on a per acre basis, solar is an order of magnitude more profitable or will bring in more revenue than a wind turbine will. And let's just run a quick scenario. So let's look at this 160 acre tract here. And let's say these are fairly new turbines. Let's say they're two and a half megawatt turbines. So for easy math, let's just say they're making $15,000 a year. So you've got 15,000, 15,000, 15,000, 15,000. You got $60,000 per year on this 160 acres. Now, due to the proximity of, these, of this substation and transmission line, you could probably put 160 acres of solar panels on there if you was lucky. And if a developer wanted, if you had 160 acres of solar panels, the typical payments in this part of the country, anywhere from $600 to $1,200 per acre per year. So you can do the math there pretty quick, right? Either $60,000 for the turbines, which is still great, still really, really good, right? This property was not generating $60,000 in grazing cattle every year. So it's a phenomenal boost for this property with these wind turbines. And it's a significant amount of revenue for 30 years, a lot of money. But if you got 160 acres of solar panels there at say $1,000 per acre per year, it's, it's an order of magnitude above that, right? So that's just something to consider. Every parcel is different. Every, not every parcel is gonna be great for solar or wind or carbon or battery storage or oil and gas. But that's why we live in an amazing country where we have diverse natural resources, diverse industries, and what might be really good for one parcel might be really poor for the other and vice versa. So it's always good to know what you have there. Um, the last question before we wrap up here, um, how valuable is access to transmission lines? Lisa, it's a good question. Um, what I would say is, the answer to that question is dependent on how big of a piece of property you have. If you have 20,000 acres and you're five miles away from a transmission line, the developer's not going to really care because you got 20,000 acres and they can put an enormous energy project on you and they'll just run a transmission line across those five miles and get over to your property. If you have 20 acres and you're five miles away from the transmission line, it's probably not gonna be a feasible, at least at this point, until a new transmission line or a distribution line, the much smaller electric lines that, that you have a little runner coming from your house that goes into a telephone pole, those are distribution lines. Now they can't handle enormous solar and battery storage and wind power projects, but they can handle smaller ones. So the closer you are, the smaller your property is, the closer you need to be to a transmission line or a substation or a distribution line. So um, that's it. We're at our top of the hour and we've answered all the questions. Um, one last disclaimer for the attorneys that are on the call. <laughs> uh, nothing in this presentation uh, be, can be represented as legal or financial advice. We try to give you guys as much uh, information and uh, different scenarios that you need to be considering when you're going through these different offers. Again, leverage the platform, get your properties up and listed. All of my properties are up and listed and uh, see what the market's willing to do. So uh, you'll be, re be receiving a recording of, recording of this video. You'll receive a presentation and we have a significant uh, number of other webinars and other learning materials if you're interested in some of those other, other topics. Um, please feel free to join us two weeks from now. We're going to be talking about um, water rights in the western portion of the United States, a phenomenal, highly, highly successful um, land professional who knows far more about water rights than I do is going to be joining us. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, that topic, uh, feel free to join us in two weeks. Thanks everybody and have a great day.